Hello, everyone, and welcome to Loops. I'm Kevin Forsyth, and on this podcast, we discuss God's word, his church, and everyday life, always asking the question of how does this loop back into our life and God's kingdom? Our mission here at Loops is to empower others in their walk with God through kingdom-minded discussion. This is the first episode of season three. And as you can see, if you're watching this episode, of course, we have a new setup in our studio. A big shout out to my wife, Faith Forsyth, for taking that on. And also, during the last few months, we had a custom sign made of our logo that just adds that final touch to the studio. And I wanna thank our pastor for pushing to get that made. This week's guest, and the very first guest of 2024 and season three, is our very own pastor, Pastor Kevin Bradford, from Greater Bakersfield's First Pentecostal Church. I wanted to have him on to share the theme for 2024 that he set in motion at this last month's 238 Youth Conference here at GBFPC. The theme of the conference was No Empty Chair. It is also the theme of our church going into 2024. He shares his vision and passion for what 2024 holds that I believe will inspire you and give you a drive to do great things in the kingdom of God this year and to fill that empty space. Welcome to Loops. Well, Pastor, thank you so much for joining again for 2024, the first episode. Um, obviously, we have a new setup. For season three, this is what we're launching this episode for season three going into 2024. Um, you had the sign made, yes. which is amazing, <laughs> by the way. You, you surprised me when you texted me that picture of it, yeah. um, of that sign. Um, amazing setup. Um, again, I want to give a shout out to my wife um, for designing this. It's it's came out fantastic. It gives it more of a relaxing kind of yeah. uh, setup here. It takes the table out. It does more conversational and not right. quite so rigid. Right. The other one was, well, we're going <laughs> through the phases, you know, yeah. we're, we're upgrading as we go yeah. uh, with anything. Um, but I wanted to focus this episode to kind of launch off this year, launch off season three, but a launch mm -hmm. off of 2024. And I want to go over the theme that you set out in uh, at 238 right. uh, last year of no empty chair. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to start out of you just giving kind of a high level explanation of what no empty chair means and what the theme is. Yeah. So we were kind of sitting around trying to figure out what would be a good theme for 238. Um, and we were just throwing some stuff out and actually Paisley threw out the, the theme. Just what do you think of no empty chair? Which at first was kind of like, <laughs> that sounds kind of corny. I'm not sure it's going to really resonate. Uh, but then the more we started talking about it, we realized there's a lot of legs on that. There's a lot you can do with it thematically. And it definitely has a, a, a great tie in scripturally. And so for a theme for a conference, it, it has to do with doing something. A lot of times conferences, especially youth conferences are about encouraging, which is fine. Lifting up, which is fine. You know, getting, getting young people to the next phase uh, staying plugged in and what have you. But our focus this year was trying to get it off of that. And okay, what are we doing? What's our purpose? What is, what is our destiny? What should we be doing? We're not, it's not about just us barely making it. Right. <laughs> it's about us, uh, taking control and, and everything that God has given to us to propel the kingdom of God forward and fill, fill, Fill the space that might be empty in our churches, whether it's ministry, whether it's people, whether it's mentoring, discipleship. I mean, you could go on and on and on. And that's when we realized, okay, this is, it's it's kind of mysterious. Right. And so people are going to want to know what, what's that all about. And, and that's kind of cool because it's not just generic. It has some mystery to it. And so we said, this is, this is really going to work. And then when we started talking about thematically what we could do with it in terms of making its presence known with chairs and uh, table pieces and what have you, that was that was kind of the genesis of it. I really like the um, the mis mystery behind it. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I think after we told the story, obviously in the first episode of this of the podcast, but 
of loops and why we created that name. Right. I, we brought some, you know, the upper room experience or mm. I honestly, I forgot all the other ones we brought <laughs> to you, but they were in that kind of a theme. Um, but then you came back with loops and honestly, yeah. all of us on the team were, were kind of like, wow, okay, loops. Okay. What does this yeah. mean? But then when you explained it, mm. I, I love when you come up, come up with something like that. And then when you preached on that first Tuesday of the year and even last night, mm. um, you know, there's so much depth to it when yeah. you really explain it. Correct. Um, and creating the disciples. And we'll go into more detail of, of no MP chair in, in, yeah. in a little bit. Um, but I think that's an yeah. awesome thing. I, I was like a little bit of mystery. Even, even our conference is called the 238 conference. Mm -hmm. And most people, they, they'll say, I'm coming to your Acts 238 conference. <laughs> right. Like, oh, you just took out the so, youthy part of it. <laughs> like, it, it's supposed to have some mystery because if someone were to ask, hey, what, what's the 238 conference? Then you have the opportunity. It's like an inside mm -hmm. joke. It's not a joke. So it's it an is, inside truth. It is it, the 238 Youth Conference. It's then. the 238 okay. Conference. That's, you aren't that's calling the it Acts 238. <laughs> no, yeah. no. Okay. I've heard people call it Acts 238, and I'm like, wait, yeah. I, I've never actually seen no, it. No, it's, called it's the, never, the, the Acts part has never appeared. But people just, they make the trip. And so they plugged that in, but we did it that way purposely, the 238, so that if someone were to ask, hey, what's the 238? Oh, that, that's connected to Acts 238. Well, what's that about? Well, you know, that's a verse. In it's the conversation Bible. stuff. Yeah. Peter said to them, repent, be baptized, every one of you. And you, you've got something to kind of fill out the space. So you're not just saying it up front. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, I want, before we go into, again, the depth of No Empty Chair, um, and you actually brought the book of the Atlas of Furniture Design. Yes. We'll go into that. I was super excited to see that. I'm super excited for you to talk about that. Yeah. Um, but I want to hear your testimony a bit. Um, it, now, you, you can take as long as you need uh -huh. to, to explain it, but more of when you saw that face, that, that space that needed to be filled. Mm -hmm. Again, you mentioned you know, No Empty Chair there's a part of it that we look at what space needs to be filled within the church, within ministry mm -hmm. um, and all of that. When you felt the calling to, you know, to preach, to be, yeah. I know, you know, being a pastor became later down the line of yeah. ministry, but when you saw that space to be filled, can you kind of walk us through that and how you yeah. stepped into that and all the journey? Yeah. Well, space was pretty much filled up with anything that had to do with athletics. Um, and that's what I was pretty much driven by growing up. But when I was 18, it was my first and last year of Bible quizzing. And that year we were quizzing on the book of Romans. My cousin was a really good Bible quizzer. His now wife was a good Bible quizzer. And so they needed another person on the team. And so they're like, hey, why don't, why don't you join Bible quizzing? So I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do it, this is going to be my first year. It's going to be my last year. So I'm going to devote some time to Bible quizzing. It was on the book of Romans, which is an amazing book. Uh, so in the process of that year, memorizing verse cards, spending time, you know, there's, there's a lot of time in, in not only memorizing, but reviewing and sitting there and going through some of that. And then the spiritual uh, highs and lows of a year finally had really something tangible to connect to spiritually because Bible quizzing was a part of all of that. And so anything that you were going through, you were bouncing it off of these verses that you were learning. So in that year, at some point, really felt like God through Bible quizzing and through Romans was really kind of speaking to me about reprioritizing my values, uh, where I was in life, what were my expectations, what was I going to do in the future, moving forward. And and that's at some point during that year really felt a real shift that God was calling me to do more and be more. And so I went and talked to my pastor, who was also my uncle at the time. And that was kind of the genesis of starting out in, in ministry. It was through Bible quizzing. That's amazing. Yeah. So through um, kind of plugging in that space that, there was some empty space. There, 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 there was. was. <laughs> As a 17 year old going on 18, yeah, there was some empty space. And it was filled up by a lot of other distractions. But 
that year really filled some things in my life. Bible quizzing was impacting. Um, you know, you have seminal moments in your life that you can look by and back and you can say that really had an impact on my life. And that year of Bible quiz, I only quizzed one year. We were in North Dakota, so there were not that many teams. We were able to go to nationals. I think we ended up with like a three or four way tie for 13th or something like that. Um, and I was never, I was kind of, uh, the partner to jump in and grab one here or there, but I wasn't the best quizzer. Uh, but it was some of the best moments of my life memorizing the book of Romans and it, it doesn't leave you right. memorize Romans. It's not going to leave you. And so that in my life really filled some, some space that changed things for me. The, uh, is there a reason, is it the distractions that were kind of there that you didn't Bible quiz earlier than that? Uh, I just was, it's too much work. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a lot of sacrifice. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I saw my cousin doing it, right? right? He's got his cards out and he's going through it for hours. I'm just like, man, that's some dedication. <laughs> uh, let's go play basketball or do something. Um, so I, re I realized there was a sacrifice connected to that. And then, to be honest with you, at that at that particular stage in the game, I didn't even know if I could do it. I didn't think I I didn't think I had the ability, the smarts, the memorization. I didn't think I could do it. Um, but it definitely tested me and uh, changed a lot of things. My my whole perspective wasn't really on school. Uh, you know, I was working. I was paying my own high school tuition. So I was working from like 11 o'clock to four o'clock in the morning and then getting up at 7.30 and going to school and school from 7.30 to three, coming home and just doing that over and over and over. So the focus and the priority really wasn't on education. It was an ACE kind of school. And so I was just kind of getting by and any time that I did have, it was wrapped up in whatever ball you could shoot or throw or kick or, or what have you. So I didn't know that I could even do it. I didn't think I could do it, but I did. And it changed a lot of things for me. It helped me figure out, I mean, how to study. I didn't even know how to study, uh, to memorize, retention, uh, follow up. A lot of things fell in place for me. And then when I did it, I realized, man, eh, you know, I'm not just your typical quote unquote jock that just likes to play um, sports, but I can actually do this. And I, that was also part of the journey in pursuing higher education and trying to better myself. So, I mean, a lot came down to that year of Bible quizzing. That's amazing. Yeah. Wasn't there a pivotal moment? Didn't you have an opportunity in athletics? And did Bible quizzing change that direction at all? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there were, you know, I don't know how far I could have gone. I don't know how, you know, real, how far I could have penetrated that world. But, yeah, there were, uh, we were playing with guys that were playing for the high school, local high school teams we were playing with guys that played for the local college teams. You know, this is North Dakota, so um, you got to factor that in. The talent there, probably the talent pool is not as great as, say, in California. But but still, there was that, hey, you know, we could, we could even figure out how you could go to school where you're going and still play with us or uh, stuff like that. So there was definitely that, that pool of... I could make a go of this, but if I do, I know it's going to have an impact in terms of my spiritual walk. Um, or I could devote some time in Bible quizzing. And so I chose to do that. It was the best decision I ever made. Yeah, yeah that's incredible because you would never consider yourself somebody that would go to college and do what you did. Oh, no. No, I, no, I wasn't even interested in that. And, and so I lacked a lot. I and mean, people don't know this. So I, at some point, decided that I'm going to go to college. And uh, I, I, I was so insecure. Because, I mean, I just, I was not, I didn't spend a lot of time in studying and education. I mean, again, I was, I was working and 
playing. And so school wasn't, I was just very, barely getting by. So graduation wasn't with honors. <laughs> um, and high so, school graduation. Yeah, high school graduation wasn't with honors at all. So I, I really questioned whether or not, you know, I was smart enough. Um, so I ended up going to an adult learning center where, I mean, this is all remedial stuff, right? I didn't even know how to add integers. I didn't know how to put together an essay. I, I was just, these are basic stuff. And there was a lady at the Adult Learning Center. I still remember her name. Her name is Julie Smezrud. And uh, she was a teacher there. And she inspired me to go as far as I wanted to go. And she taught me math writing essays, everything that I really needed in a high school education, I got at the Adult Learning Center in about six months of really applying myself. And she was very inspiring, very vivacious, extrovert, you know, rah, 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 rah. And it's that's what I needed. I needed somebody. Is that, that where your drive for education came? Well, that's that was where it where I felt like I could try, I could do, I could actually do this. Hey, I can do this. So then I went to the university there, Minot State University, uh, and and started taking classes and realized that, you know, I'm not, I'm not as dumb as I thought I was. And if you applied yourself, you could achieve anything. So that kind of started my educational journey. My educational journey really started at the adult learning school. Not high school, so <laughs> not junior that. high, not high oh. school, not elementary school. It really started at the adult learning center. So it's so impacting to know that when it, when people look at you, your saints, mm -hmm. and many of your um, peers, you know, no one would ever think that you thought that of yourself mm -hmm. because oh, yeah. you are very educated, and yeah. I know you don't put that in front of you, yeah. but to think that Bible quizzing filled a space. Mm -hmm that took what well, you were filling a space with dead things. It was mm -hmm. like a dead space. Right. So the empty chair mm -hmm. was filled with Bible quizzing. Yeah. And that kind of spurred you into a different direction. Yeah, absolutely. That's I'm already it. inspired to, to yeah. you know, I, I thought about like I, when I Bible quiz, I Bible quiz for two weeks and I, I'm, I know I'm admitting that here on camera, but I struggle with the same thing. I, it's hard for me to focus, especially when I was younger mm -hmm. to, retain just as I'm reading, I kind of, you know, I distract, I'm distracted easily, all that kind of stuff. So I thought the same stuff and I've never would have imagined that, uh, my pastor would have been, yeah. you know, thought the same thing at, at one point. Yeah. And that was my, nobody at that point, my grandfather, hardworking, uh, my family, hardworking people, but there was nobody at that point that had graduated, graduated from a four year university. Um, so that became kind of the goal that I set out for myself. My cousin is a month older. We both kind of set out on that journey to to complete and finish that. So, so graduated from Cal State University Bakersfield was a it was a big big deal. Um, and then from there, you know, I I went on to get my master's and I've dabbled around in some other stuff, and have found that the more you know, the more that you learn, the less that you know. So. Uh, there's a humbleness that comes with that. But um, yeah, definitely Bible quizzing that year of studying Romans at the age of 18, feeling a call of God in my life, and then realizing, man, I've wasted a lot of time uh, catching up, going to the adult learning center, then going into uh, university. I'll never forget that. The first class I took was intermediate algebra. I mean, this is insane. I took intermediate algebra. I didn't even know how to add integers at the adult learning center. I, I, integers were foreign to me. So I had no understanding about math at all. And and so I entered intermediate algebra with Irmala Madhawk. She was an Indian lady. I couldn't understand her. So she's teaching intermediate algebra. I can't understand <laughs> a word she's saying. I'm going home. Uh, so I got, I passed the class though. I passed the class. I got a D. And it was passing, but I wasn't satisfied with that. So I took, I took algebra, intermediate algebra, uh, three times at the university, three times. And every time I just, for whatever reason, I couldn't get it. But there was one teacher that I finally got 
and, and studying in the library one day. It was like clicked. I was doing something, solving an equation or something, and realized the principles that regulate algebra. You, you know, you can move stuff from one side to the other side as long as you're doing the same thing. And it clicked. And so I, I got my A in intermediate algebra. That's crazy because when I came yeah. back to Bakersfield mm -hmm. from the Midwest, you were my algebra two teacher yeah. mm -hmm. in, in my sophomore and junior year. Yeah. And I would never thought that you struggled. <laughs> right. with yeah. And through that experience, you're far ahead of where I am mathematically, but it was enough to give you that foundation to move beyond that. And a lot of, of learning helped too in, in math by when you actually teach something, it's one thing to learn it, but when you start mm -hmm. teaching it, that's when you start kind of understanding it. So, um, yeah, if you're talking about filling up empty space in my life, that, that would really be kind of the testimony. I really like what you mentioned about distractions and you mentioned it, um, brother Brock V, um, dead space that you're filling. You're filling the space, but you're filling it with things that are not mm. um, benefiting you. Ultimately, ultimately. it's emptiness. It, ultimately, yes. Right? Oh, I mean, uh, that's one of the, um, that's one of the things that we point out on a spiritual plane, a spiritual dimension, a spiritual level, becoming who we are essentially and striving to be what we're supposed to be. You can do a lot of stuff that may bring you satisfaction for a, for a season, uh, but really, it's it all it provides is emptiness. At some point, you're going to realize this is not really doing for me yeah. what right. it once was, and all the stuff and everything that I'm doing in, and the vanity of the world and everything I'm pursuing, I feel empty. Mm -hmm. And so the whole theme is is that's the gospel. So if you're empty then there is something that can fill you. And that's the spirit of God, the anointing of God. Um, so, yeah. Um, before we go into more, more in depth of No Empty Chair, I don't know if you wanted to ex explain the book now, but I would love to understand the, yeah. uh, the theory of uh, Atlas around uh, well, furniture design. Yeah, well, so when we said, okay, this is what we're going to do, 238's at the end of a year and the beginning of another year. And so we're like, if you create a theme and it's a good theme, why wouldn't you just carry that through the next year for the church? Yeah, right. for the, it's launched at a conference, but what if you carried it through for the church? So, and that gets you thinking, you know, really serious about your theme because you don't want a theme that's not going to last a year. <laughs> so it's got to be pretty good. Uh, and in a conference, you, you can kind of reveal uh, what it is, what the theme is, and people may touch on it. And certainly people touched on it during the conference. And we did a video promo of what it meant, but you really can't dig deep into it because I mean, you're not the preacher, you're not preaching. You're just one that is a part of a team that's created something and you're basically relying on them to, to plug things in. And I think our speakers did a great job because great. it was about, look, this is things we can do. Here's a Bible study. Here's stuff that you can do. There was comments on uh, intercessory prayer. And so there's a lot of stuff that was good in terms of action. Uh, but you can't really do a deep dive into a theme unless you're going to sit down and, and create a, a message for it. Right. So when I started doing that, um, I started looking at chair design, architecture, and this book is <laughs> this book took 20 years to make it was 20 years in the making and it's the atlas of furniture design when was it finished uh it 2016 say? i believe it has chairs from 1850 to 2017 so just kind of a fun table book to look at where did uh, you find this book. Uh, so I just started looking online about architecture and chairs. Again, it was like, if, if you're going to put together a message on no empty chair, right? right. You, you need some illustration to launch the, That's the discussion. A great illustration. And so, uh, yeah, so it's a fun book. And so I bought it. I'm going to keep it here at the church. For people to kind of thumb through. Uh, and I guess what I wanted to say by way of 
of introduction in the message is that this is a big deal. This is a big deal on a, you know, an architectural level. This is the Atlas of Furniture Design. So a lot of time and attention has gone to this. No less the work of God and what we're supposed to be doing. So I use that just kind of as an example and launched um, with Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, Zacharias and uh, Elizabeth and John the Baptist are all filled with the Spirit in chapter 1. Um, and it's an amazing story. So I mean, you can you can build that out. Now, Zacharias, he, he's not completely sure what's going on. He questions, and an angel appears unto him. There's a lot that happens there. He can't speak, uh, and this all has to do with the birth of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is coming on the scene because there's been 400 silent years. There's no prophetic voice. And that's empty space. That's a, yeah. I mean, if absolutely, it, it, it's an empty chair <laughs> for 400 years, there's silence. And, and because of that 400 years of silence, they have over, uh, emphasized scripture. Ironically, they, they've made the scripture into, um, a God. Literally. That's why right. you end up with the religious groups. There's no voice speaking. What do you do if there's no prophetic voice? You deep dive into what you do have, which is you've got the scripture, and then you deep dive into it so much that you create the mission and the Talmud. Now you've got traditions, and Jesus acknowledges this. He said, you've made your traditions greater than the scriptures. So now you've got the scripture, plus you've got the traditions of the scripture, and that's what they're hyper-focused on. And so they're really hyper-focused on that. To the point where when Jesus does come, they miss the opportunity of recognizing who he is because they're so tied in right. to the scriptures and their traditions. So uh, there's empty space there. There's 400 years of empty space. There's no prophetic voice. And John the Baptist is coming and he fills and occupies something that has been lost. He's calling them to purity. Uh, he's baptizing them. He's saying there's something coming that is greater than I am, and, and he's going to fill and occupy the space that has been lacking and missing. And he's talking about Jesus. Uh, real quick, I want to tie this back to what you mentioned when we talked about, about filling that space with, um, almost like filling the void, filling the space with things that don't help you in the end. You know, the 400 years of empty space, it was filled with whatever they had. They were trying to fill the mm -hmm. void. There was no you know voice from God in, in those years. But also in our lives, we're filling the space, you know, if we're not giving it to God or put it into ministries or put into study, we just, you know, we start falling away from God. We start, yeah. you know, losing that connection. Mm -hmm. um, but then you, going back to your testimony of when you started Bible quizzing, you gave that one year Bible quizzing, but that's that one year when you said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. I'm going to mm -hmm. give some time and study. I'm going to put fill the space with something that is going to benefit me. Right. Uh, when it comes to, you know, spiritually and mm -hmm. connecting with God. And then, of course, you, you're, you're I'm sure your story is very long and, and your testimonies, uh, we don't have the time to go into the depth of it. But um, I just think it was, it's it's amazing to see the um, correlation there of filling that space with something that's going to benefit you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and how can you do that on a church level? I mean, in Jesus' ministry, he's coming. You, Luke launches this. It happens. Jesus is doing his ministry. At some point in um, I, in some point in Luke, he is in the synagogue and he said, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord." And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he said unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Mm -hmm. What Jesus is doing, there's, there's a void and there's a lot of emptiness. And he comes in and he gives that reading out of Isaiah. And it's just like, boom. And everybody is looking. His ministry exemplifies that. He is 
occupying, he's taking up, he's filling. And, and so that, that's what his ministry was all about. He selects his disciples to help in that endeavor. And the cross in Calvary, it doesn't stop there, but it continues into the church. We are supposed to take on the same demeanor as Jesus. There's a world, there's emptiness, uh, there's a lot of empty space, there's a lot of dissatisfaction, dysfunction, confusion. And if you go back to Genesis 1, there's a lot of chaos and void in the world. And so what's going to fill that? In Genesis, it was the Spirit of God moving and brooding upon the waters. And he creates. So in John, John goes back and says, he picks up the same origin, and he said the Word was made flesh. Jesus is coming to fill the space and the void. So the church is responsible to do the same thing, to create life, and we do that through the gospel. Can you give us some examples of, of empty space that could be filled? Um, and looking at this specific question, like yeah, within well, the church or within uh, your walk? I mean, you could take that. Well, okay. So an empty space, say, in a church. Th this, was, this was really cool because when we were kind of talking about this uh, theme, we were thinking about it. We're kind of resonating on it. Um, I was asked to speak at Lake Isabella's anniversary and installation of the Elder Hodges are starting a church in the L.A. area. And so with Garrett Hodge was taking over. And so it was a combination of anniversary and installation. And so at the same time, we're trying to come up with this, this theme for the 238 conference. Um, and Brother Hodge, in the middle of the service, he gave a testimony and threw up some pictures of when they first started in Lake Isabella. When they first started, they were they were going to like this this rec room. I'm not sure what exactly. The veterans hall. I the veterans hall. Yeah, it was a veterans hall. So they're going to this veterans hall. That's where they started having church. Well, when he's putting up these pictures about, you know, when they first started, it was just their family and maybe two other people. There's a picture and he's standing at the pulpit looking in the pictures, kind of looking out. It's all empty chairs. <laughs> so I'm like, and yet we're now, now, you know, here we're sitting looking at this. We're in a building. There's a good group of people. There's thriving revival. Things are happening. And it's like, that's, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. That's what no empty chair means. This family went somewhere where there was empty chairs, literally empty chairs. And they started working hard, hard work, a lot of years and effort put into that. But at their uh, retiring from that work and going to start another work, they're going to another place. It's going to be the same thing. Empty chairs. That's a lot of, that takes a lot of work and effort. That's not easy right. to do. Um, but it is extremely rewarding. So that's, I mean, that's literally physically empty chairs represents evangelism, discipleship, going out, making connection with people and filling the space. So every church has got that. I mean, the 238 Youth Conference, we're packed out. You, there are no empty chairs. Right. But in every church, when everybody's gone in our church, you look out, we are very comfortably full, but there's still room. So there's an empty space. You go to a home missions church, a lot of times that's what you're starting with mm -hmm. <laughs> is empty chairs. Yeah. So, um, and then how do you feel that? Well, that's a, that's a big discussion. You know, if you're, if it's just you and you're starting out, you're on a home, home missions front, a, a lot of that is you and your family and Bible studies. And it starts there on a larger scale. There's a lot of things that you're doing to try to get someone from just coming in because they were invited uh, to coming to church, to experiencing the power of God, to teaching them Bible studies, to bringing them into fellowship, to getting them into a discipleship class, uh, all the ministries that we do, everything that we're doing is trying to fill that space in a person's life or help fill that space in a person's life. So um, though that's corporately an example of empty space. And that really was the thrust of the theme. But, uh, you know, even in our own personal lives, whatever we do that fills up space that's meaningless, 
time wasters, mm -hmm. time stealers, mm -hmm. uh, scrolling, scrolling, and all of a sudden we realize we've wasted two hours right. or something mm -hmm. like that. That's empty space. You can't get that time back. No, you can't. That's empty space. And you didn't even realize it. But you sat there and you just wasted a bunch of right. time. So the theme this year was how, how can we how can we take initiative and 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 stop that right. in some areas? So can we can we read the Bible through? Can we fast more days than we did last year? Can we teach Bible studies? What is it that we can do individually? Can we set some limits on how much time we devote to social media? Right. Because you know, in some ways, we may be stealing from other areas that are more important than what we're doing. I want to mention something from that you preached last night. Um, you mentioned the, the Great Commission, and again, the our our goal in life is that Great Commission is to make disciples, is to teach you know, to all the nations. And looking at Brother Hodge and the church in Lake Isabella, you know, the empty chairs, or even in our church, empty spaces. That is the main. Um, space to fill. First, mm -hmm. you have that one of making disciples and filling the actual physical chairs right. of making disciples. But then as you grow, there's, and you know, taking our church, for example, there's a lot of different ministries, a lot of different roles mm -hmm. and, time, and time that you can um, fill that space with. Yeah. So kind of looking at it as filling actual chairs and, and that main um, following the Great Commission, but along with, you know, filling the space getting involved in ministries, mm -hmm. uh, there's so much that can that you can get involved in and put your time toward. Yeah, that's a theme. And you're using a theme to just try to capture people's attention for something that biblically goes back, uh, goes back to Jesus' ministry. You're just doing it in a modern context. You're saying no empty chair, but really what you're saying is go do the Great Commission. Right. Yeah, I like <laughs> so, it. It's like twofold, like you're saying, hearing you talk. The first thing you see is an empty chair. And how can I get someone in it? How can I fill up the void? And then you first looked into yourself. There's empty chairs in us. Mm -hmm. You fill it with the gospel. It's it's so thought provoking, yeah. the theme. And it it's good that we're constantly reminding people. I know that we're going to decorate in the church and put some empty chairs. Yeah. But I like it because it it motivates you like, hey, is there something I should be doing? It's a, I feel this void. It's a modern, it's it's just a modern theme that you're using as an illustration to exemplify a biblical truth. Uh, but if you just threw out there the Great Commission, <laughs> uh, may not resonate as much, but in terms of, of people in a, on, a, on the basis of a theme. Uh, but that, that, is the, the truth that we're trying to drive is that God has called us to do ministry. Let's do it. Right. Let's, let's, uh, let's fill the space opportunities that we have and let's put our hand to the plow and let's work. I know for me, I, this year, I'm one of my new year's resolutions to get rid of distractions as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I just feel like this year is a little bit different, at least for me, you know, my walk with God, I feel like I, I'm finally getting to that point where I'm putting more time, getting rid of those distractions. Kind of last year I started doing that, mm -hmm. um, but putting more effort toward, um, you know, different ministries and studying and, um, and all of that. And it's, it's amazing the, um, you know, the, the drive is really building, especially when you announce the um, the theme for this year. And then you, that first, I told you when I think a few days after when I talked to you, I said you were on fire on that Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I can see the passion that you had for it. Okay. And I love the, again, the themes that you put out. It's not just, you know, very broad. It's, it's mysterious, but there's so much depth behind it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's just, I know driving me and, I, and again, that's why we're doing this to kind of put, push that theme out there and encourage other people to um, fill that space. But again, um, one of the other, another thing I was going to mention was everything I'm doing now is I'm trying to think of all the ministries I'm a part of, you know, the Great Commission. What's the what's the main goal of everything? Mm -hmm. Is to bring in souls, is to teach right. people. Now I'm not a, I'm not you know from coming from my perspective I'm not a preacher mm -hmm. um, I'm not a pastor or anything like that. But you know I could teach Bible studies. Amen. Um, and I taught a Bible study last year. It was my first one in a long time. And yeah. Um, and then. 238 hit and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm pumped now. Yeah. I, I know I want to, I want everything that I do, this podcast, you know, the music ministry that I'm a part mm -hmm. of everything to be centered around that. Right. Um, and I know, you know, that might resonate with some other people as well. 
And, yeah. and I, you know, I encourage other people to whatever you do, do it with that in mind because it comes from a different mindset than, yeah. you know. Well, it, it takes a lot of people. A church of our size, it takes a lot of people. There's a lot of teams and you're working together. That creates camaraderie, unity, excitement, passion, energy. And there's a lot of people involved in that. And so really the chair is the, it's the structure. It's the system. If you don't have structure or systems in place, you're not going to achieve much because you're just haphazardly going about spontaneously thinking things are going to happen. And they typically don't happen like that. Um, you got to really think and you have to take some time to, to be intentional about everything. So that, that's what we're trying to do on a church level is look at every ministry. Let's, let's create what needs to be created. Let's plug people in. Let's get people, people involved. They get excited. Like you just said, Bible studies, I can do this and I can plug in. Now all of a sudden you, you got the chair is there. The structure is there. The system is there. And, and sometimes it's easy to get systems in place and still not do any work. <laughs> Absolutely. If you spend yeah. all your time developing the system, but nobody's doing the work, mm -hmm. it's not going to achieve anything. Yeah. Or if people are just running out and they don't have any kind of structure or system, sometimes that can create a lot of, of chaos. So, but if they're in balance and you really think about every ministry, this is what we're doing. And this is our goal. And this is what we're striving for. We're reaching for a miracle. We're reaching for these, these things. Uh, and it takes people to get involved and plug into that. Yeah. Then you have people doing the actual work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think that's where revival happens. Right. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how does someone know what space they can fill? If they're trying to think, I know we, you know, we can teach Bible studies and all of that, but if someone is wondering, okay, I want to plug in, I want to fill a space, but I don't know where to, to begin. Well, there, that's a, a nuanced question. So the first part of that, I would say, if, if you have thought about your structure and your chair as a system, at the beginning of the year, we laid out all the ministries we do in our church, and there's a bunch of them. So, and they all need help. They all need people helping, contributing. So that's one thing you can, I mean, here, here's all the things we're doing. Right. Now you can plug into something. Uh, so plug in, don't, don't just sit on a pew and say, I'm, I'm here to reap the blessings of the church. Rather say, I want to get involved in a ministry and look at all the things I can be involved in. So that, that answers that question in one way, right. but in another way, I think that's a personal thing that is between you and God. And that's what work out your own salvation, fear and trembling means, which means you've got to seek that. And because God's got a, he, he's called you to be a saint first, but then there's also specific callings that he has in your life. And you've got to find that. And if you appoint somebody to something that's not really their calling, that's not always beneficial. But if somebody comes, like, say, Kevin Forsythe that says, hey, Pastor, what do you think about starting a podcast? Right? Uh, that's something you felt passionate about. If I were to plug somebody in, we would have never gotten to this place. But it's because something that you feel passionate about and you feel like God's calling you to contribute. And, and so now you there's more stake in the game because it's coming from your own... Um, place of burden and passion and inspiration. And I think that when, when people come like that, uh, that's where ministry flourishes because they, they've realized, okay, there's something that we could do, or there's something that's missing, or I can help with this. Mm -hmm. If, if those are the questions they're coming to you with, uh, you're going to see success. But if I'm saying, I th we need to do this, we need to do that, and then you start plugging people into that, but it's not really their passion, right. they'll do it because they feel obligated. You've asked them to do it, but it may not really be successful because it's not coming from their heart. Do you feel like that there's a, um, how do I phrase this question? There's a struggle with smaller churches versus larger churches 
where a, most of the people in the church, which I know there's not as as many men, ministries or there may not be as many moving parts as a larger church, maybe, mm-hmm. um, but others that they're kind of tasked with some things that may not be that, but it's something that in a way needs to be done due to the large, to the smaller scale. Yeah, well, sense. I think there's certainly di- dynamics to a small church versus a large church. I've been in a small church. Our church is of good size. I think in a small church, you're doing everything because you have to. <laughs> if there's youth service, you're at youth service. If there's a Sunday school, you're teaching Sunday school. Anything you're doing, it's you. You're building that. Right. And I think that that gives you a lot of purpose. And so people feel like they have purpose. And um, if you're going to be successful as a small church, you got to go out and you got to get it. And so you got to work together. And so it's already kind of built into that if this is going to be successful, we've all got to work together. I think when you get to a larger church, medium-sized church, the, the pitfalls are... I can just, I mean, everything is, this is all good. I can just sit here and man, this is awesome. This is great. And you're never spurred to do what you would have been in a small church. And I I mean, I've had people who grew up in our church and moved to a smaller church and then have come back and said, I'm glad to be home, but going was a great experience for me because I recognized I wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so I went there and they said, Hey, you're doing this and you're doing that and you're, you know, step up to the plate. Uh, and it was just so easy for me to be blessed and not be involved. I think that's a dangerous place. And I think that's why a church has to grow smaller as it grows larger. You gotta, you, you gotta be plugged in and doing stuff, um, to have a sense of purpose and feel like you're taking ownership because if you're not, you're just reaping the blessings and, you're relying on somebody else to do it. And that's not good either, because in some cases you got 20% of the people that's doing the work and 80% are riding on the backs of the 20%. So how do you shift that? That's what we're trying to do this year with no empty chair. Let's shift that. If there's 20% doing all the work, then some people are doing too much. So how can we pull other people in? You're doing A, B, C, and D. You should only be doing A. Right. You're doing four things. And because you're doing four things, you may not be doing the, you're probably doing the best that you can, but you're not doing the best at one thing. Right. So let's take B, C, and D off of your plate and let's pull somebody else in and give them the opportunity to be a leader and plug in. Now you're expanding that percentage to where everybody is working. And when everybody's working, the load is lighter and the influence is greater. You went right into my next question. That was actually going to be my question of, of some people doing in a way too many things, but then you had mentioned something before of making disciples. That's that's our, our whole goal mm-hmm. of taking some things off of someone's plate to then plug someone else in to um, build them and disciple them and to grow them to a point mm-hmm. where that other um, someone else yeah. may be. Um, but, you know, can you can you expound a little bit more on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the answer there is the size of your revival, to, in my thinking, is directly connected to the quality of leaders. That's good. I mean, yeah. you say, uh, uh, we're going to have a hundred soul revival. Okay, wonderful. Do you have the support system and leaders for a hundred soul revival? Because if you don't, are they going to, I mean, where, where are they going to be in three months, six right. months? Yeah. What year? does that mean? Just filling people full of the Holy ghost. And then we have to disciple. You right? go, well, you, if you don't have a structure, a system, and you don't have leaders to actually take some time to make sure that you're responding to those people, they're going to slip through the cracks. Now you feel really good because it's awesome. The, the numbers are great. And I'm, I'm certainly not taking away from anybody that's had a revival like that. But I think if you're looking at it from a macro level, um, you're only going to have success as your leaders are successful. So um, that's what we're doing this year with the theme. We're trying to plug people in and build um, leadership. That's uh, that's awesome. Again, I I love this theme. 
I love the view that you come at these kind of uh, these themes or titles or names and things like that because there's so much depth to it. Mm-hmm. I know we can go for so go into so much more in depth if we had more time. Mm-hmm. But in closing here, I, what challenge would you give somebody listening or watching right now to fill a space that maybe in their church, um, maybe in their personal walk with God in their own lives? What would you challenge them or what advice would you give them? Yeah. Well, I think everything that we said kind of has addressed that, which is wherever you are, allow yourself to be used for God. Right? If, yeah. if it's teaching a Bible study, if it's, if it's mentoring, if it's helping discipleship somebody, there, everybody fits into this picture differently. Some people are on the front cutting edge of evangelism. Some are on the mentoring side of doing follow up and, and, and everybody's got a strength there. And so some people are better at mentoring than they are out on the front lines. They're terrible front lines, but they're amazing mentoring. That ice has been broken. They follow up, they check in, you know, they're making those connections with people. So everybody's got a place at the table Um, and nobody should feel ashamed because my strength maybe is in discipling somebody and doing a Bible study, but man, I just really fear going and knocking on doors. Okay. Well, that's why you have teams and that's why the harvest is so amazing uh, because there's three teams, there's prayer teams, there's harvest teams, there's follow-up teams. And everybody has a place and everybody's working together and nobody feels marginalized. Right. Right. So I think you take that same concept wherever you are and you say, no, no matter how small it is, I'm going to, I'm going to fill the chair in my local church in an area that where it's needed. I mean, it could be stocking the Kleenex boxes. It could be cleaning the Mm -hmm. church. It could be teaching right. Bible studies. It could be mentoring. It could be involved in ministries. Just do something. Right. And I think if if we're not careful, we get we we end up in this trap of talking, and we talk about it, and yeah. we mm-hmm. could talk yeah. a good game, a lot of but, good ideas. Well, oh man, yeah, we could prognosticate ad nauseum, but are we actually working? Are we doing right. stuff? And this year, what we made a determination to do is work. We're going to work. And this entire year, that's going to be our our theme. We're going to fill every space that we can in our personal lives and in the lives of the ministries of our church. And and nobody's going to get left behind. Everybody's going to plug in to doing something. So, and, you know, if you're not doing anything, we hope that you come feel uncomfortable by the time the end, the end of the year. Rolls I like around. that. Yeah. You should feel uncomfortable. I, it doesn't matter what it is. You could, you could create your own ministry, start a prayer team, start a, right. um, so I think when you do that and everybody's working, they're not as distracted. They're not, they don't feel the need to be entertained. They don't feel the need uh, for some real shallow stuff in our world, social media and everything else that goes around that, their purpose is in the life force of the church and they're rallying around that and that gives them a sense of passion and identity. And man, when you create that kind of culture, I mean, we're, one, we're one month in and we're writing that. Mm-hmm. And we got the rest of the year to go. But if you lose that, you know... It, People get depressed and they yeah. get frustrated right. and then they get upset and that leads to a bunch of other problems. And I think if we keep our eye on the ball and we strive uh, to fill every empty space that we can. Uh, Filling the empty space yeah. is something that's going to benefit you. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's yeah. good too because some people like, well, where can I go? Point me where I should go. But sometimes, you know, they feel like they're going to fail if they start something. I think, you know, the the scripture says to seek first the kingdom. How are you seeking the kingdom? I think the best way to do it is to get involved. So if you don't know what to do, 
start simple and just just help in something right. yeah. help in t rockets have you ever walked over there mm-hmm. and saw the jungle it could be with these awesome kids from the neighborhood right. and and just serving them food i mean you're serving i think once you start doing just something simple that's where the burdens start to grow and you see something mm-hmm. like hey we need an area here for example uh, we have someone that well, now we have a valet parking system for our yeah. elders it yeah. birthed out of them hey you know they did something and then they saw this need and now there's a ministry mm-hmm. where elders can come pull up they'll take park their car and they they don't have to walk across the parking lot that's serving that's ministry but they didn't start there right they mm-hmm. found it doing other things yeah so i think no empty chair is something that pushes somebody hey what can i do well yeah. just do something yeah. and don't worry if you're not that great at it mm-hmm. who knows where god will lead you through get involved yeah get yeah. involved get involved well, thank you so much, Pastor. That yeah. was awesome. That was I could keep going forever. Um, just chatting with you on it. I love love talking with you. Uh, I appreciate you and the drive that you have for our church yes. and for um, for God's people. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. Amen. Yes. And I would just, in closing, I would just like to say that it's a team effort. There's a lot of people that have plugged in their uh, creativity and their desire to see great things happen. Um, and that's, that's what I enjoy is, you know, if, if you're trying to come up with stuff and you're trying to push stuff and that can get very, very tight, tiring. But when you're a part of something that's, that's flowing and it's going and you, it's not like you don't feel like you're swimming upstream, but everything's, everything's rolling downhill because everybody's on the same page and you're not trying to push this ball right. up the hill and everything that you meet with is resistance and struggle mm-hmm. and, and obstruction. And, mm-hmm. uh, that, that can be get very, very depressing, frustrating. And, you know, a lot of pastors uh, have the Monday morning blues because of some of those things. But when you get a people that catch a vision, and then you're all working together. Man, it is the greatest it thing to ever be a part of. Synergy and just yeah. flow. Yeah, and that's that's a cool thing to be a part that's of. That's what I felt the first service of the year. And you had said something yeah. like, I, you know, I think it was that service. You mentioned like you may feel that you could take on any temptation, any yeah. situation, any problem. Um, and I, I hope that I know that's going to ride the rest of this year. I know that the passion is going to be not just on you, but the ministry team. And everyone that's involved in everything here at yeah. our church. And I hope that the same, you know, if you're watching, listening to this, I hope that you could take something from this and uh, apply it to your life, apply it to your church, Amen. and see some some great things happen. Fill the space. Fill the space. Fill the empty chair. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs>